selections meeting, and then do a brief recess, do the soil board, and then go back into select Motion to open. Second. Today is Wednesday, June 1st. It is the meeting of the Krishna Board of Selectmen, calling the meeting to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Bear with me with the mask. I'm a little bit rusty. I haven't had a mask on for quite some time, but I am uh, on the tail end of COVID. As I mentioned, we do have a soil board meeting, so I'd like the board, we go into recess, brief recess to go into the soil board, where we will uh, discuss the organization of that board. Um, is there a motion to recess the selectmen's meeting? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Is there a motion to open the soil board? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Great. Thank you. Uh, we are in now the soil board meeting. As you can see on the agenda, there's a few items here. I think it's a little premature for that. But I do think uh, this board needs to um, organize or reorganize. And as you know, there's a lot of moving pieces and a lot of moving parts to the soil board. Um, a lot of it pertains to P.J. Keating, as you know. Um, unfortunately, um, of these board members, I am the only one, uh, the last man standing, uh, as far as in the way of a uh, current lawsuit, personal lawsuit, with P.J. Keating. So I'm somewhat hamstrung from some of the things that I can and cannot do or cannot say. Um, however, in the past, um, <coughs> I do think, um, you know, serving as the chairman of the Board of Selectmen, it's an opportunity for other board members to serve um, and, and serve as the chair of the soil board and with the board members serving as, as ranking members. Um, I do think any current chairman of the board, board of selectmen, should not serve as the chair of another board. I think it's just too much authority and too much power. So I think that that should be farmed out. And um, you know, I do have some thoughts about a proposal. Um, I put it on the table that the vice chair of the, of the Board of Selectmen would serve as the chair of the Soil Board, and then that would be on a rotating basis. In this way, there would be always some continuity, right? There would always be a deep bench. Um, however, uh, that would be my proposal unless somebody else wants to step up and, and has a different proposal uh, to talk about that. But um, I do not believe the other items that are on this agenda tonight are too... Um, uh, it's premature to do that, um, especially without being organized. So, gentlemen, I put that out there, that proposal for discussion or for uh, deliberation. If you're not comfortable taking that up today, if you want to discuss it, you know, think on it and discuss it more, we can table it. But I do think, you know, amongst the three of us, somebody other than the chairman of the board of selectmen should serve as the chairman of that committee. So I guess your motion, you know, theoretical thinking, would be to have myself as the chairman of the soil board. Is that correct? It, you just about happen to be the vice chair, right? So again, it's not based on person. It's based on whoever the vice chairman is. And then you know, next year when you're the chairman, Mr. Hinckley would then slide into that spot. I think it's a, it's a really important committee. Um, <coughs> and it's an important board. But to have the chairman of the board of selectmen serve as the chairman of that, I think is just it's too much. For one person, I think it's just too much authority um, over you know, two, two important boards. So I think basically what you mentioned about the uh, litigation brings a lot of merit to the conversation. Um, Mr. Hinckley being our newest selectman, um, my experience with what's going on at PJ meeting, I'd be more than happy to take on the role as chairman of the soil board. Okay. So is it, uh, can I have a motion to, Jim? how about we do this, if we could just uh, maybe a motion to adopt the policy of the <coughs> vice chair of the Board of Selectmen shall serve as the chair of the soil board. This year it just happens to be you. Good luck for us because you are, uh, Mr. Gasper, probably the most qualified and most experienced on this issue and I think the right man for the job at the right time. Uh, so if we have a motion to adopt the policy of the vice chair of the Board of Selectmen shall serve as the chairman of the soil board. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to appoint the Vice Chair of the Select Board as the Chairman of the Soil Board. Great. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Great. It does happen to be Mr. Gasper, so thank you for stepping up and taking that on. Um, regarding the items on this 
agenda. Um, I do think, Mr. I guess, Mr. Chairman of the Soil Board, if you'd like to uh, table those, it is premature to do that, and we can have a separate Soil Board meeting dedicated to these issues, separate and apart from the Board of Selectmen's meeting. Yeah, Mr. Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I'd, I'd like to uh, make a recommendation to the Board to also have a, an executive session pending litigation with P.J. Keating with Town Council prior to coming out, out of the gate and having public discussions with At a future message. date, right? At a future yeah, date, that's correct. Okay, great. And I make a, that was a motion. Second. And I'll make a motion to table the remaining items. Okay, I'll second that. All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Okay, great, thank you. A little bit anticlimactic, folks, but I do think it's important to get our house in order before we start taking on all these issues, okay? Thank you. Uh, with that, is there a motion to adjourn the soil board meeting and go back to the selectmen's meeting? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Great. Motion passes. Motion to open the selectmen's meeting. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We got our money's worth today, okay? So uh, thank you very much for your indulgence. Indulgent, uh, today we do not have any uh, meeting minutes to be considered. Our first appointment is with Heather Chu and Rebecca Tomlinson. This is a this is the feel good part of the meeting. Ladies, uh, if you could come up and uh, talk to us about your endeavor and spirit of uh, good afternoon. I would just like to thank the board for allowing us to have this fundraiser that we had, which was very successful. Um, all of the residents and other folks came out and they showed their generosity to the animals of our town. And it allowed us to be able to share some of that with the shelters and some of my feral feeders, as well as my wildlife rehab rehabbers. So it worked out really well. We had dog food, cat food. We had some wildlife animal rabbits, guinea pigs that I was able to share with everyone and everyone was happy and we're hoping that in the fall we can do this again and hopefully it'll be as successful. So Town of Cushnet came forward as they always do and they helped us out. So made us happy, made a lot of the animals happy and a lot of my feral feeders as well as the rehabbers and shelters because after COVID, as we had suspected, a lot of the shelters are being um, filled with animals that people took in during COVID and now unfortunately they are surrendering them. So. The food really came in handy. So again, thank you for allowing us to do this. Yeah, of course. I mean, this is a no-brainer. Thank you for coming forward. I mean, I guess the question I have too is that, like, you know, there are people who need assistance, who need mm -hmm. help, and you always just think in terms of food pantry and food for for humans, right? And, but those, but people who do need help often have time have pets. And are we helping, you know, is that part of that equation? Absolutely. As well? We still have food and those resources. Yeah, absolutely. We still have food over at the um, Council on Aging. So if anyone needs anything, right. they can Just give us a call. And certainly we can deliver it. I, that's what I was doing all last week. Awesome. I was delivering it out to our shelters, mm -hmm. our rehabbers. There were some folks that I did reach out to that I knew needed help. So it worked out really well. That's amazing. And it, it could be, you know, this could, the donations can be on a rolling basis, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't have to be event specific, right? No, so if people, not if people at all. want to donate and uh, contribute to our uh, our efforts here and Becky and Heather's efforts, um, please contact either the Selectman's office or uh, Rebecca or the Council on Aging and donations will take them at any time of the year. It just doesn't have to be at a specific event. Correct. That's awesome. Great, thank you. Right, thank I know you. Heather, or I'm sorry, Mr. Gasper? No, I just want to thank uh, Ms. Tomlinson and Ms. Uh, Heather Chu for uh, their efforts. I mean, it was extraordinary. I stopped by the Council on Aging and dropped off a donation myself, and I just couldn't believe the room full of food. So congratulations on your efforts. I mean, you exceeded, I bet, your own expectations, right? We did. On the yeah, food we did. drive. We it was really pleased. commemorable for what you did for the community and all the folks here. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you. If you don't mind, I'd like to say something. It was nice to finally meet both of you. Uh, I've been watching both of you do tremendous things for our town for a long time. And it's nice to be a part of the team that you guys are on. And uh, I just want to say thank you. Welcome to Team Cushion. Welcome to Team Cushion. Absolutely. You're true assets to this town, and we all appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, this, this here is like, you know, some of the little things that all get built upon, which makes this town so great, right? Is that. You know, whether it's your efforts there or, you know, the Lions Club. We've got so many organizations, Boy Scouts, who contribute to the overall, um, you know, quality of life in our town. 
and um, that's what a small town is all about. So thank you very much. Keep it up, and whatever we can do to assist, we will. Thank you. And I know. Well, she can stay too because she was there. Yes, <laughs> I know you want to uh, also uh, say something uh, of an event that took place. So most recently. we submitted a meeting mail. Um, we just want to thank Mr. Kelly for sponsoring our Welcome Back Barbecue. Uh, you know, you've watched the news, mental health, there's such a crisis, among, especially among our seniors who just have been isolated for two years. They're in financial crisis. I mean, look at the prices at the grocery store. Mr. Kelly swooped in and he paid for all the food at the cookout. So they enjoyed hamburgers, hot dogs. They danced all afternoon to the meadow larks. I gave you some pictures. Um, he was there. He was grilling. Um, Becky was there. The, the, couple, you, the two of you were there. So it was really, again, kind of what she said, like, this is just a small town. We pulled together. And so everybody in this room is very appreciated. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Thank Kelly. You. Thank you. I can say um, I'm glad we signed your contract because in a small in a small time, you know, from the time we brought you on as interim to now as full time, uh, Mr. Kelly, you have made a tremendous impact. Uh, and so for that, thank you. Um, I think you know those small gestures um, are really important. That's really critical. Thank you. The thanks go to those people over there. They're the ones who organized it. Yeah, I think he has two gray hairs named Heather and Becky, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thank you. You guys are a great team. I'd love to see you guys working. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. All right. Next item on the agenda is under the DPW. Mr. Gaspar, I think you're going to be a busy man in the next few weeks. Uh, so Okay, I've been a busy man for the last few weeks. <laughs> Turn it over to the, Mr. Menard. Yep. Hold the cat. <laughs> You're going to get me first. Yeah. All right. Love it. Just because I'm going to talk about the RAP grant that we mm -hmm. have. Um, that was given to us by the state. So it's similar to Chapter 90. We received some information from Sean at, at the state that they are giving us a winter recovery assistance grant for $198,000. And that's in addition to our Chapter 90 funds. The only difference with this is Chapter 90 can roll. This cannot roll. We have to spend this money from between July 1st of this year and June 30th of next year. I was just explain that to Mr. Menard. We have to have the work done, the invoices sent, and the money back from them by June 30th. So I think this is where we should spend this money first, in my opinion. Dan's going to talk in a minute about paving where the other money is. But this is a grant that's given to us, and it's a one-time only in any money it's not spent by june 30th we have to do that is this a new program it's brand new only this year i don't know if they will do it again next year i'll tell you what first of all it's, i think it's an awesome program but second what i love about it is it forces us to have a sense of urgency mm -hmm. um, on these projects right i mean Correct. No, at no fault of anybody but i know this we've had a lot of grand ideas for a lot of things and then something else comes in and takes over and you know but i think the fact that we've got a compressed time frame mm -hmm. uh, to deliver results is, is really great and um, you know mr gaspar has, has really had a passion for these types of projects and is working you know with um, the utilities so if the board mr gaspar will accept i'd like mr gaspar to um, work with mr kelly and the dpw uh, to come back with a plan of where you want to tackle what neighborhoods or you know where, how you think we should spend this money and then the board will will give its blessing and um so yes that and we'll also have to discuss where we're going to spend our chapter 90 money for next year okay. too uh, dan has some information on that he's going Good. to talk about mr chairman yes <clears throat> as far as the wrap money goes i mean it's almost two-thirds what we get in for chapter 90 right it's 198 yeah. we get in a roughly 315 or so exactly. chapter 90 fund mm -hmm. so it's it's a it's a good sum of money for us to make a good impact in our community um, and as you stated in previous discussions with the board with potholes and things of the like, Mr. Minot and I have had some engagement about that quick patch that doesn't last. Um, the time is now to be paving. So, you know, I make a recommendation to the board members as well as Mr. Minot to get a list together to bring forward um, and have that discussion on what we're going to use this money for. And if we know of certain areas, and I could name off a few right now, just like tops of roads um, that are all banged up that you really need to go curb to curb and patch a 20 foot 10 foot swath and don't go over there and just go like that in a hole that's not the way this money should be spent i think we should be spending the money but i think it should be spent wisely and we, we do patching we do correct patching right as we change our mm -hmm. uh, forte around on how we design and, and think of patchwork is more or less curb to curb because a lot of roads need to have that curb to curb and it ain't going to work just going in and 
yeah. you know, in a bucket and dropping asphalt into a hole, a pothole. That that stuff don't stay. And for instance, I'll give you one one spot that I'm already, and I think you went over there this winter, Mr. Menard, was the curve on Middle Road to Peckham Road, that shop bend. Yeah. That con is all deteriorated over there. So that's something that you probably do a 30, 40 foot swath and just patch that whole corner right around and get it done and done mm -hmm. right. So that's just an example of an area of patching. When I say curb to curb, and that one might require 30, 40 feet, whatever Mr. Menard determines needs to be cut out and patched or, or milled, as we like to use the terminology, where you just plane it down an inch and a half if, that, if Mr. Menard determines the road can be milled. That's that's his prerogative as DPW director. But Mr. Anklin, I, I completely agree. Uh, and specifically on that corner, it's dangerous at the point right there because there's a big hole and you have to jump the line. So stuff like that's definitely okay. where we should focus. At. I totally agree. Great. Can I have a motion to, uh, uh, Mr. I'm Chairman? Sorry, yes. Just so you know, this allows you to do work some work that is not allowed under Chapter 90. And you can combine the two to come up with a program that is comprehensive nice. for a certain section. Mm -hmm. So it is almost the frosting on the cake Great. that you can use it to complete the whole picture. Yeah, very good. We can, you know. So if we have a motion to um, designate Mr. Gaspar uh, as the selectman's representative to work with Mr. Kelly and the DPW to come back, come back to develop a plan, come back to the board uh, for approval. So moved. <coughs> second. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Motion passes. We'll be back anyway. We'll have. We're, I'm working with them. We have to have a contract that will need to be signed by all of you as soon as I receive it. I'll awesome. turn it over. Great. Thank you. Okay. Actually, it's July 1st, right? I'll, I'll have the contract before July 1st. Be okay. signature. Okay. I'll come see you, Cap. <laughs> <laughs> Spent a lot of time in your office. <laughs> All right. And thank you, Kathy. Welcome. All right. Next item is uh, speaking of road paving, schedule and street opening permit discussion. Again, it's in Gaspar. You're going to be busy. Um, okay. Some I. Okay. Um, well, we have um, what we're going to be doing in the next few months. I guess we have that emergency roadway funding which was um, 30 grand that we have to use by June 30th. So um, I was gonna use them on uh, Highland and Hindle Street, which are dirt roads, they are accepted. And these are like a one-time thing that we figured I could get these done with that money, you know, doing it in-house, so. What's the name of those roads? Highland and Hindle, which is off of uh, Randall and Lucia, it's kind of in the corner there. Okay. And this is one we're always fixing every year, it's a dirt road and, yeah. you know, so it's one of them. Highland, I'm sorry, Dan. And Hindle, Hindle, there's smaller roads, short, not that wide either. There's only a few houses down there, but again, it's dirt roads, if they are, if they accept the street, believe it or not, dirt roads were accepted back then, I guess, so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's one I figured that money we can use for that, and, and especially when we got that, uh, you know, that 198 <coughs> for, you know, the patches, which we can do a lot of, you know, the milling in, taking two inches out, and, there's a lot on Nye's Lane. You could actually do all of Nye's Lane with that money, that kind of money. So yeah, we should have a schedule though in, so. in the cost breakdown with each road. Yeah. That's what I like to see. Okay. So when you talk uh, Highland and Hindle, okay. you know, what's the cost versus what we have in the cumulative bank of Chapter 90, right? So if we yeah. have 400 and something, I'm pretty sure we're, we have a decent amount. Yep. We just received 315 or whatever, right? <coughs> yeah, we have some left over. Yep. Well, we, yeah, we're going to have a little left So what's the yeah. bank? versus what the cost is to do these kind of roads and what's yep. the plan because I know that you've got some money um, appropriated off this side that we approved in a past to do matter poison. Correct. So that one, that's the one, you know, again, when we went for that, we might have to take some more money out of that. I don't know if the cost, I, I know the cost is going to be yeah, increased, you know, so it's not mm -hmm. going to be the same type of money to do it. But actually that's going to be in July. Um, I talked to the uh, the reclaimer guy that uh, mm -hmm. we got, Murray, that won the bid. And he's going to be there in uh, like the second week of July. Yeah. That's what he told me. So, but he told me we'd be there in May too. So uh, hopefully, just nice to see what you, what your bank is, yeah. and then what we're subtracting off the bank, and then we'll have an idea of where we're going and what we should be preserving. Because yep. Hamlin Street Bridge will be done hopefully spring of next year. Yeah. That's what I'm getting kicked the can getting kicked yeah. down the road by the state again. Yeah. Um, and we talked about paving Hamlin Street, and that's going to be a pretty large cost. Yep. So. Yeah. Again, you actually, if I didn't mention Hamlin Street, 
What is the design? Is it, are we in the design phase over there? And no, the design's done here. It's Actually, done. it's going out for bid. Um, you know, the state's putting out the bid. I think it's this month or July. I forget what. Going out this week. They're going out week. to bid this week. Yeah. So I knew. Yeah. So this is week. there opposite of the you know the little factory? Yep. Right. Yep. Is is part of the design at all? You know, would be t would you be able to create some? You know, like lookout area or some area for people to you know if they wanted to hang out and you know, well we were kind of looking into no nah, really wasn't and uh, we kind of wanted to do a sidewalk and we we're looking into that and that turned into a, a, a too much I guess and they had to you know all the designs they had like 20 engineers over there and and they wanted uh, not doing it but um, so, you know, I do the whole well let's <laughs> give us the whole set of plans yeah. well what's going on you know maybe there's you know, a change the order or two yeah. that uh, but if you know if you can enhance that area yeah. I, I think you're spot on if you get yeah. it you know able to do some kind of sidewalk or I see that as a, an opportunity there yeah. for somebody yeah. to relax and you know chill out. So maybe it's cool. Maybe that's, that's something that England should be crossing from Buzzards Bay Coalition, isn't it over there? Yeah, put that thing down yeah. at the end, so maybe yeah. we could talk to them and do something along yeah. the riverfront. Yeah, yeah. Maybe when that, yeah, when that project gets rolling, yeah, definitely. I agree. Okay. Um, we also have um, Eversource funds that they um, gave us for the, you know, the patchwork. That's mm -hmm. so the streets are Laurie King. Uh, Roach, Dorothy, uh, New York Ave, Fairfield, and Willow is the streets that we're going to do. Now, what about Anthony Street? Because I know I've now them one. them they're still working on. So they they did some work on Anthony, I think Bernard. Um, I don't know what, one other one over there. So usually we let them settle out. Uh, I don't you know what I mean because they don't contact them that good. So we let them go through you know at least six months time before they but. You this is the money they, they gave us this money to they would have to pay somebody to go patch the road so the funding that they gave us was actually enough so we could overlay the whole entire street so we're going curb to curb so they were only going to do a nine foot cut but they again they have to yeah. pay somebody to do that process so we're going to kind of go curb to curb on these because okay. i knew this was going to be on the agenda i actually took another ride down anthony street which is um, the next row over, I believe, from Laura yep. Keene. That yep. I have mentioned, we're going to do the whole road. Yep. Um, previously, that we talked about, Dan, with the Eversource funds. And I'll tell you, um, <laughs> we, Mr. Kelly and I are working on a policy for road cutting. It's, it's actually right here. It's pretty extensive okay. um, versus the couple of sheets that we have now. Um, yep. Once we're done reviewing that, we're going to share it with you and, and get some more input from you. But um, Anthony Street, because Mr. Wonow brought it to, to the board's attention a few months ago, whatever it may have been. That road just sunk in. So let me ask you this. Fillable flow. Yep. They're not required to use fillable flow because that's what fillable flow is supposed to prevent is the sinking of the road. And yep. that road, Anthony Street, because yep. I was just there today, yep. has sunk about six inches from the regular surface. And, I, and yep. the way I look at it, that's totally unacceptable. Yeah, no, they, they're supposed to cover that. So like... You know, again, I wasn't aware of that. If that comes to my attention, I just call them up and them guys are going to go take They They have to keep that, maintain that patch until they do their final thing, which, like I said, when they settle up, they're what, not required to have full so, uh, flow. Nope. They, their uh, claim to it is it does something with their, their gas pipes or something. So they don't use it throughout the, I don't think any place in Mass. Nobody, I've never, every place I've worked, they've never used full really? whatsoever. Nope. And um, I don't know, because they're a utility <coughs> company and they can get away with that, I don't know. But no, they do not. So well, They surely um, can't get away with what they're doing yeah. on Anthony no, but they, they have If I was a resident down, over there, I'd be irate down. and I'd be yeah. on the phone with DBW every day yeah. until that road's done. Because yeah. it's just, when I went down it today, I couldn't believe how far it sunk in. Yeah. So that's totally have, unacceptable. Have you any calls on that? I have any call, one call on that. So. Well, then there's I a lot of patient people. All right. I have called. Okay. I have called. My office? Yes, I have, yes. Well, she's right there, and I yeah, don't have. When they were on Laura Keene Avenue, I called. Yes. Are you the? Oh, Laura Keene, yeah, we have Laura Keene on. Yeah, to yeah, yeah. Yeah, Laura Keene's written down. Yeah. We're going to be doing that one. So we're gonna we're gonna work. Yeah. Mr. Kelly's got a pretty good plan here. It's it's a yeah. it's a lot more extravagant than I ever thought for you know cutting roads, yeah. but it makes a lot of sense. It talks about cutting straight lines. I mean, it's like spaghetti out here yeah. in a Christian, and they're just starting to flock everywhere. So. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm at the mindset right now is to stop ever source permit, right? And yeah. say no more of this until we figure this out when you start doing your. Well, I think right we way. should. I mean, I know. You, I think that's a reasonable conversation, and we should probably put it on the agenda for the next meeting. Um, uh, it would probably be two meetings. Okay, whatever it is, but I think we should put it on, post it on the agenda if anybody from EverSource wants to come 
have that conversation with us. But um, you know, it's, it's a disgrace. It's outrageous. It's outrageous. And I, it's something that needs to be addressed. And thank you for your. your, your One question. thing, Mr. Chairman, to note is Todd and uh, Nick on these uh, Eversource funds, they put uh, segregated accounts together so it can be tracked. Yep. And they dealt with uh, Dan and Kathy to make sure that this is all going to be able to be monitored now. Anything from Eversource. The funds that they're given, the road it's committed to. Yep. And we don't want to get too far ahead either because, you know, we don't know what's going to happen in that dialogue with Eversource. So I don't want to be taking in a million dollars from these people and be backed up 15, 20 roads and then we ain't got the resources to go out there and do it. And that turns into a pile of you know what. So we need to get on this, Mr. Kelly, you and I. Okay. Is that in the, uh, I don't see the policy, is the policy in here? No, it's something that Mr. Kelly and I have been reviewing, okay. something he's presented. So you'll bring that? From his path. We will forward it to the board for review, okay. obviously. We'd like to give it to you a week or two before the meeting. Yep. There's a lot to digest inside of it, but I think yeah. Mr. Kelly's probably be pretty good at putting some bullet points together so you don't have to go through the torture that Sounds like you're <laughs> I'm going through. I'm a, I'm a big fan Just of Just saying. <laughs> For those of you who have worked with me in the past, I'm a big fan of the executive summary. You know, you can just get right to the point. Correct. That's good. That's what we'll try to provide for the board. Thank you. All right. All right. Well, thanks, Dan. Keep on having good work, all right? Great, Great Dan. Say good work. Great work. All right. Item number three, sewer privilege free fee for Bradford Street. Um, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Mr. Kelly. Do we have to read all the whereases? No. Uh, can I just make a motion to approve 3 Bradford Street, the sewer privilege fee for yeah. 3 Bradford Street and 5 Bradford Street in the amount of $12,610.41 for each one of them? Is that appropriate? As presented. As presented. I make a motion to approve 3 Bradford Street and 5 Bradford Street as presented. There's a motion on the floor. Second. And a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Carry. Thank you. Good. Next item under outdoor seating discussion. It looks like we have two, two, uh, two applications. Rochelle's and Captain's Place. First, let's deal with Captain's Place. That seems to be a little bit of an easier uh, one to deal with for uh, Captain's Place, Mr. Marmello. Uh, uh, petitioning for um, outdoor seating, three tables, four to five chairs each, not a big deal, has parking and off-street parking as well to accommodate. And uh, speaking with Mr. Marmello, we indicated he's not really, just wants to have an additional area for people to hang out in the summer. I think it's a great idea. Um, any questions regarding Captain's Place? Mr. Chairman, I've been by, I've seen what he's put out there and laid out there, put the awnings attached to the building. Um, I don't see it taking away any parking spots, to be honest with you. They were already parked out there by the fence. Um, makes it a little bit more difficult to back up with a, a donut mill building, but they're still using the existing parking spaces, so I have no problems with that. Mr. Hinckley? I agree. Right. Is there a motion to approve Captain's Place outdoor seating? So moved. moved. Second. All those in favor? Is there a motion? There's a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. <coughs> the next one is a little dicier. Again, I'm a big proponent of the outdoor seating. I think it's a great opportunity for businesses to uh, you know accommodate uh, customers but also we got to be mindful and respectful of the um, of the, the neighbors and the surrounding area and, and uh, traffic concerns I know the, our building commissioner Mr. Merritt has um, expressed some concerns and I think there's some historical issues here uh, with Rochelle's and Scullabons and Mr. Gasper you've expressed uh, some concerns uh, I think before we take any action at all, it would make sense to invite um, the applicants in uh, to a future meeting to talk about some of the issues rather than either you know, deny or modify um, without having an opportunity to, to, to speak with them. Um, yeah, I think Mr. Merritt's letter, Mr. Merritt's here actually right now. Mr. Merritt wrote the letter, the first letter that I have in my book on April 25th, 2022. Yep. Um, with the elimination of parking spots, closing off the back of the building for parking in emergency vehicles. This creates an issue whereby customers are now parking on Main Street and Evergreen Drive. Um, it, is a, it is a public safety issue to me right now. Mm -hmm. So, unless and until 
the owner of the property opens up the back and brings that building back into compliance, um, you know, there's not much we can do. Or maybe it's without compromising public safety, and I'm never here to compromise public safety. Right. And as much as we want to accommodate, I'd like to accommodate. We can't do that. We sure would like time. to. So uh, we can head direct maybe the town administrator to contact the O'Briens, um, express our initial con our concerns, and offer them the opportunity to come in and, and, and talk it through, or, or you know work with Mr. Marriott and Mr. Kelly on a plan. And resubmit it to the board, but I'm all for inviting them in to have a discussion about it to see what we can do to make it work for them. I mean, maybe in a perfect world we can, um, but if you can only you can only fit so much into a certain area, and the last thing we want to do is see, see somebody get hurt. So, um, is there a motion to uh, direct Mr. Kelly to reach out to uh, the proponents and to invite them in to discuss the, the application? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. All right. All right. We've got a couple doozies on our uh, tonight. Um, His concern on this letter. Okay. To be addressed. All right. Public safety overtime deficit and staffing. Mr. Kelly, you have uh, brought this to you. You raised this. Along with us a number of times, and so we we'll turn it over to you. And I think we've got the respective chiefs here. We'll do one at a time, I think. And you know, I'd ask both of you to um, you know just kind of frame the issue. But then I've got a proposal for a potential solution. Ms. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I've talked to both chiefs. There is uh, an issue here where there is a large amount of uh, in deficit on the overtime accounts. Uh, in the past, intra-departmental intra transfers have been used to offset part of that, and then interdepartmental transfers after May 1 have been used to balance the budget. The issue we have this year is you have uh, almost 200,000, uh, over $200,000 in uh, public safety and then you have uh, a, a, a approximately 126,000 deficit in your town council account. And that is far beyond anything that you could rectify with reserves. It's, uh, I will discuss a possible solution at the end, but this is the, unless you rectify the situation by budgeting more in the overtime accounts or by addressing the overtime issue with the chiefs, you're going to see this year after year after year, and I think the spreadsheets show that. All right. Um, so why don't we do this? We'll give uh, Chief Richmond opportunity. Again, we don't need um, you know, we don't need to uh, executive summary. Yeah, executive summary. Please, thank you. Uh, I'll be as I'll be as brief as possible. Um, as Mr. Kelly, and first of all, uh, thank you and good afternoon. Welcome. Uh, congratulations. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, this is a great meeting to get yourself started with. Um, Mr. Kelly alluded to the uh, budget structure uh, with the overtime and public safety, and I'll speak specifically to the police because we have uh, Chief Gallagher uh, that can speak to the fire, is, is traditionally um, the overtime budget has been underfunded. And I'm not just talking about the last two years that I've been directly involved as police chief. Um, going back probably nearly 27 years I've been here. And I kind of liken the, the overtime budget uh, for the police department almost uh, like the snow and ice budget. You, you budget a certain amount, you know it's not enough, and you hope for good weather, and when you don't get it, you scramble at the end and, and figure out how to, how to solve the problem, which is not really a, an excellent way of doing business. Now, the budget structure that we're at now, about uh, four years ago, three, four years ago, um, the town made a commitment to cut overtime. The overtime at that time was in the mid-$400,000 range. Uh, 
and the, the commitment was made to hire three additional full-time officers, add an officer to uh, uh, the day shift and the evening shift um, to reduce the overtime. So we'd have an extra officer on, the first person out sick, holiday, whatever, would it need to be replaced, thus you wouldn't have to pay the overtime. So at that time, $200,000 was taken from the overtime budget and added to uh, regular salaries to accommodate that. At the same time, the, um, the town also made the commitment to go to a, a, a primarily civilian dispatch uh, um, center. So in order to do that, we had to hire two additional dis full-time dispatches uh, to what we already had. So when I took over about two and a half years ago, uh, we had actually added five full-timers, um, three offices and, and two dispatches uh, to the mix. Uh, what we've run into is um, first thing is that the full-time personnel have the right of first refusal on, on any type of, uh, uh, of shift work that comes available, which inevitably becomes overtime. So we, we actually added five people to the, to the line, so to speak. At, at the same time, we, um, we lost the use of, uh, of part-timers, partially through attrition because we've done so much hiring in the last three or four years. We've hired five or six uh, full-time offices from our part-time ranks. At the same time, we weren't able to replenish those ranks for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, COVID slowed down part-time academies, put a pause on part-time academies. And number two, uh, police reform in Massachusetts effectively ended the uh, part-time police officer program. Uh, that coupled with the dwindling interest in uh, pursuing career in law enforcement, uh, we are down currently to, to one part-timer um, that has limited availability. In the past, we'd always have part-timers. You referred to a bench earlier. We'd always have four or five part-timers that maybe worked one, two shifts a week at best uh, when they were needed. There was always one or two of that group that were hungry and were looking to get on full-time and would take anything that came to them. So we were able to supplement the budget by utilizing part-timers uh, for, for up until the last, really the last year and a half. Um, that's that's unfortunately going away and as you can imagine there's a significant pay difference between paying a part-time a straight time and, and a full-time person overtime to fill in these slots now specifically to um, FY 22 which is where we're at now um, I mentioned earlier you know using that snow budget amount uh, analogy we pray for good weather uh, traditionally we we hope that lightning doesn't strike well lightning struck a few times uh, in 20 in, in, in FY 22 um, we don't budget and have never budgeted for, for, for long-term injuries or illnesses, uh, for extended military leaves, or contractually negotiated buyouts. Uh, in FY22, uh, we have uh, one officer that's out injured on duty, uh, has been out since late, late, um, late October, and, and is still out at this time. Um, we had a retirement of a long-time officer just after July 1st. His contractual buyout um, came from the salary line item. Uh, we also had an officer leave that cashed in some time, so um, those were things we didn't budget for. Um, also, we've had extended military leave, as you know, as I've mentioned before, we have two officers that started in the beginning of April, uh, I'm sorry, the beginning of May on extended military leave, and they're going to be gone. We expected them to be gone a, a year, and we won't see them until maybe April of, of next year um, when, they, when they return. Part of the problem was leading up to that deployment, it was, there was additional training uh, that these officers were required to attend uh, military leave. So we would lose them, we would have to replace them or we wouldn't have them to, 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 to backfill. Uh, in addition, the, the, the one um, person that's in the National Guard that wasn't deployed, uh, went for about eight weeks, was activated by the National Guard uh, and uh, was up in Shirley Guard in prisoners uh, in the fall. So we lost the equivalent of, of 10 months uh, in counting um, of, of, of an officer, you know, if you combine all, all the shifts. Um, we've also, in addition to that, we've had uh, in this fiscal year three legitimate uh, and separate month long uh, uh, sick absences. Um, three different offices, three different circumstances were out for a month, so we lost three months there. Um, we've had, we had an officer on light duty for about uh, uh, four or five months. We, we made very good use of him, but he wasn't available to work those road shifts during that time. He's back to full duty now, not without an issue. We also had a couple instances continuing on. I hate to keep blaming back, blaming COVID and talking about that, but we had a couple of COVID cases and, and that required, you know, close calls and isolation. Not a significant amount, but when you add it all together, it, it, it affects us. And again, I, I'll go back to the part-time 
uh, the part time problem. We, we've always had that, that, that advantage to use the part timers. It's, it's a change in philosophy on how, on how we've worked. Unfortunately, it's, it's nothing that, that I did, the board did. Um, state of Massachusetts um, you know, implemented the police reform, and there are some good aspects to it, and there are not some good aspects for it, and this is one of them. Um, very similar to Cape Towns and West Towns are struggling with the same situation now. So that's, that's pretty much okay. where we're at. I mean, is, is funding that, that's still remaining to come in. We have a small amount in grant reimbursements, maybe four to $6,000 coming in. Uh, we still haven't got the journal entry for the school department's por uh, portion of the school resource uh, office's salary. They pay a portion of it. So we got about maybe about $28,000, you know, coming in there. Um, there might be, there'll be a slight overage in the regular line items. Uh, for salaries for dispatch due to grant reimbursements that we received early in the fiscal year But uh, that, that's pretty much where we're at now um, as far as staffing goes uh, We normally have 20 full-time officers uh, full-time. Yeah, full-time officers seven sergeants and, and 13 patrolmen um, We one one person once one one of those people is out on on medical and two left to go to state police and the other two uh, have left to uh, uh, Serve their country overseas so we basically lost 25 percent of our department in a very short amount of time uh, the hiring process for civil service is difficult uh, the list uh, closed today so we're gonna take a look at that list there's a chance we might be able to hire um, we have certainly got to send at least one person to the Academy there's a chance that we might be able to get somebody that has an Academy uh, which will help us sooner than later but if somebody needs a part-time Academy then we're not gonna see, I mean sorry needs a full-time Academy we're not gonna see them helping the town and working here uh, probably April of next year if, if all the stars align depending on the, the timing of the academies so uh, things you know you know whereas six months ago we were we were in pretty good shape um, lightning struck multiple times and, and kind of puts us in the situation we're in now okay. thank you uh, Mr. Jeff, do you have I, I do I, I think you know I'm I, just so you know chief I just received this packet um, with your explanation, normally I would go in and shoot the breeze with you. Yep. Um, and you the scenes to get a better understanding. So I'll do that yep. when we have time. Absolutely. But I think the chief brought out a, a pretty good point of something that we don't put in the police department's budget, and that is military leave. Um, I think that could help offset some. If you use it, it's there. If you don't use it, it just turns over to free cash the following year. So I think that's something that maybe this board needs to have a discussion with the chief try to come up with a calculation and maybe put that line item an additional line item in your budget for that reason to cover that expense not that it helps us out now but when right. these officers came to us full-time they came to us full-time Academy trained um, compliments of the, the state of Massachusetts in, in the military they put themselves through a full-time Academy that we didn't have to pay for or pay for the Academy itself or pay for their uh, Pay their salaries, so there was significant savings there. But unfortunately, you know, it's as no it fault. Down, Listen, they're serving our country, right? God absolutely, God bless no, absolutely. Them when they serve this country, um, I'm just saying um, maybe we should add that line item to, to cover ourselves for the individuals we have. And obviously, if we were to hire more people that have military experience and could be summoned out of the department to go serve, we we need to up that line item. And it, you know. Despite the the training they had, it really wasn't official until mid-April. One of the officers he he previously served uh, in, um, did a year-long deployment, probably about six or seven years ago, when he was with the department, and uh, he was skeptical that he was that he was going. He goes, "Hey, I've been there, done there before." He goes, "In my time, I've gotten back from my last deployment. I've been told I'm going to Africa. I'm going here. I'm going there," and it never came to fruition. And then this just morphed, you know, really official and. Uh, Really in April, so we knew we knew it was on the horizon, just like we knew a couple of candidates going to state police. We just didn't know where the numbers were going to fall on the list. So unfortunately, uh, that's where we're at. I mean, we'll be talking. I'll be going by the office tomorrow uh, to grab a copy of the list. Tomorrow, uh, the hiring list closed today at four, so we'll get those applications out, and uh, we'll probably we'll be before you sooner than later looking for a full time for the two full time appointments that we were uh, we were allotted. So absolutely. If anyone has any questions like offline, you know where to find me. Oh, Thanks, Jay. Thank you. 64 Minute Road. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, a couple things on this. The chief mentioned that the salary per line was hit for compensated absences. That uh, now you can use the stabilization fund we began. So that will take care of that. However, 
when you look at this, the 2019 change to decrease overtime, uh, the overtime is still back in the 400 to 390 range. So that really did not do anything to help. What you've got to do is drill down in and make sure, and you've got to manage it differently. Uh, there is a surplus every year in the sa actual salary amounts, but uh, as the chief said, this was a perfect storm for him. Uh, but it's something that you're going to have to look at when you, we do the budget next year, how we're going to deal with this, and how we're going to deal with su such things as long-term IOD. Do you want to pursue involuntary disability retirements of those folks, or do you want to keep them on the books? And uh, it's a question that this board is going to have to take up in the future. As far as the solution for this year, once the fire chief is done, and I will tell you what my view is on how we can come close to balancing the budget. Great, thank you. Gentlemen, I, I would propose a, you know, somewhat of a um, long-term solution or an opportunity to look for a long-term solution. Chief Gallagher, very welcome. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much, members of the Board of Selectmen. Good evening, Mr. Kelly, Ms. Leonard. Uh, you have before you a uh, packet that went out from me last Friday afternoon to the town administrator. I hope that's been included in your packet because it will serve as the uh, backup for my brief discussion tonight. Uh, and then also, gentlemen, I just handed you two pages. If you look at page two, let that serve as your executive summary. Uh, and as Chief Richmond said, there's been a lot of lightning strikes this fiscal year that's caused some deficits. But uh, I think if we drill into the current deficits in the salary line items for the fire department, you're going to see that there's a little bit of a silver line. Uh, so currently, you know that we, we start the appropriation uh, the fiscal year with $58,028 in overtime uh, for eight staff members. That has been structurally low for the last uh, several years. And from the information that Mr. Kelly provided you, you can see that we have overspent that pretty consistently since uh, 2012 uh, because it doesn't reflect the actual cost. Currently, as of June 1st, uh, we have a, I'm sorry, the 26th, which was the last payroll. We have an overtime deficit in the fine department of just over $58,000. I am anticipating a deficit in part-time EMTs of $2,250, $2,250. This is page two of the uh, handout that I just gave you. So the projected fiscal year 22 salary deficits is $60,278. We have some surpluses to offset that. Full-time surplus, if I project the known over, uh, salary costs for the fire department from now until the end of the fiscal year, including that payment that will go out in July for that last week in June, we will end that line item with a surplus of $38,023. Call salaries. As of today, with the payroll for the month of May in the books, uh, I'm projecting a surplus of $27,356. So when we add those two surpluses to the projected deficit, we're looking at a deficit as of today of $5,000, a little over $5,000. Now, we have payroll costs in overtime expenses between now and the end of the fiscal year, the month of June. Uh, the detailed memo that I sent you breaks down where our overtime use occurs. We have known expenses, such as vacation and personal time. If we were to multiply all that by the average overtime rate, we're still short. It's more than the $58,000 that we appropriated. But we've been playing the shell game for the last 10 fiscal years where we use the surplus and other line items to offset 
the budget uh, deficit in overtime. Overtime has been something that we've uh, stayed away from addressing. We also have uh, several unknown expenses. Uh, sick time is an unknown expense. You'll see what the cost of sick time was in the detailed memo. Uh, when we have folks departing, we had a resignation uh, and we had a retirement during the current fiscal year. It was an unknown cost. We had to cover 1,100 hours uh, until the new people were uh, in place. So if we add all that up, if we look at those known and unknown uh, sources of overtime expense, we get into the hole that we're currently in. However, we've planned uh, for uh, the surplus in, uh, it, as in the past, to take a bite out of what we start the month of June with and with what we actually end the month of June with. So there are some more expenses coming. Uh, one of us, we have eight full-time members now. Uh, one of them and their wife just had uh, their first child. Uh, and he is going to be out for uh, maternity leave. Uh, we have folks who are using up their vacation because they have to. They can't roll it over. Uh, so we're burning, they're burning up the overtime by taking their vacation because if they don't use it, they lose it. We have personal time that again, they can't roll over. If they could, it would come off the overtime cost for this fiscal year. So uh, I have uh, stopped the drills for the month of May, that's a drain on call salaries and it's a drain on overtime for the full-timers that participate. So we did not do any drills in the month of May, we won't do any in the month of June. Uh, and a quick survey of our full-time staff, uh, we found in excess of 55 hours of time off that folks are asking if they could roll it into the next fiscal year. Uh, and that would be 55 hours that would not have to be covered by overtime. Uh, but that's going to be a decision for you gentlemen to to make. I know there's been opposition in the past about rolling over employees' hours into the next fiscal year, but if we're, uh, if you feel threatened by that amount of deficit in overtime, then uh, maybe that's something that you would consider. Yeah. Chief, when you say 55 hours, is, it, is that 55 hours cumulative? Two employees have stepped forward to say that they would like to roll over some time or they're going to use it. So uh, 27 others, and a half per individual? Uh, I think it's 30, 36 hours of personal for one and 14 or whatever, 15 of whatever the vacation. Right. But if there's a <coughs> approval by the Board of Selectmen to, to allow full-time firefighters to roll over 48 hours of vacation and 36 hours of personal time, uh, that may move some of those who are rushing to take vacation time by the end of the year. Every yellow spot is an open shift, 10 hours or 14 hours. The vast majority of them are going to be filled by full-timers who have the right of first refusal per the contract. Others are going to be filled by some of our call firefighters. So, you know, if we can erase some of this yellow, that's overtime that doesn't need to be paid. And that could be done, ten we could start that process tonight if you were to approve rolling over 48 vacation, 36 personal. All right. Thank you, Chief. That's the executive summary. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, so, gentlemen, <coughs> we've had a chance to talk to Mr. Kelly earlier in the day. Um, and I know we're putting a lot on Mr. Kelly, but this is, you know, when you've got a new, when you've got a Ferrari, you're going you're gonna to ride it, right? And so, um, talk to Mr. Kelly. I think it would be, I'm sorry, it, it, does any board member have any questions or comments? Before I, I think the appropriate next steps would be to have Mr. Kelly work with the respective chiefs on a plan. Uh, to curtail or to examine and curtail, you know, come up with a plan that would allow us to curtail overtime or at least plan properly for overtime. Report back to the board no later than September 1st for our consideration. But I think, you know, components of that plan would be early detection, right? And then other types of, you know, truth in budgeting. I think we got to really get down to. Uh, what we have in place, or is our business model working? And you know, we've got to address this because we've talked about, right? Mr. Gasper and Mr. Hinkley, I know you've talked about it. Not using free cash. Like there's certain principles we should have when building a budget, and uh, to be able to predict and have reliability is really critical. So we're not going through this 11th hour fire drill. And um, I just think for everybody, all total, it, it'll be it'll be a better product that we provide uh, to not only the department heads, 
uh, but to the taxpayer as well. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it costs money to operate public safety, but public, mm -hmm. public safety, DPW, that's, that's our remit, right? That's what we're responsible for. And so we gotta make sure we get this right and getting the budgeting right. So if you guys are okay with that, just budgets. If you guys are okay with that plan, have Mr. Kelly work with the Chiefs and report back a little later on September 1st. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, we're already into the new fiscal year, but so that we don't end up in this same right. position next year. Next right. Year. Uh, so there's a motion, uh, could I have a motion to direct Mr. Kelly to work with the respective chiefs on that report back to September 1st? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Motion carries. Mr. Kelly, I know you have some thoughts on what we're going to do with the current issue now, correct? Yes. Uh, quickly, uh, police deficit, the projection looks like it's going to be 151,000, 152,000. Quick projection for fire looks like it's 43,379. You also have a major deficit in the legal expenses of a hundred projection of 126,000. What was police? What was the projected police? Sorry, uh, one hundred fifty-one seven eight four. And change. Uh, working with uh, Nick. Uh, projected deficit in fire. We can handle with the transfer from other departments. I'm advising that the last deficit that we deal with is the legal deficit because that is the one that the auditors will least likely to ding us for because you're dealing with a court ca multiple court cases and you've had at least one judge uh, one uh, agreement that cost you 25000 in the legal budget. So I think that is the one we solved last. Okay. Uh, as far as the police, uh, I'm looking right now at a solution that brings us within 40000 And as the police chief and the fire chief said, transferring inside the department amounts and then transferring from other departments, other budgets. There are a couple of uh, minor deficiencies in uh, various departments that can be uh, covered by transferring expenses, which I've frozen into deficit salary lines. Five hundred, eight hundred dollars here and there. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're, right now we're looking at about forty thousand dollars that we need to cover between police and fire, and that will that's a snapshot now. We'll know more when we look at the various departments' budgets and we see exactly what we're dealing with. I think we'll be able to cover both of them. Uh, the deficit for the legal, if we transfer the land court money, that brings it down to 109. If we have to, we can carry it forward to the fall town meeting and we can at that point use excess revenue from this year, which we believe will be somewhere around 400,000 to cover it. Okay. So but to knit but all that together, Mr. Kelly, do you think a mid-July time frame to come back with a recommendation, with a final recommendation? Uh, I would like to do it uh, uh, depending on our analyses. I'd like to do it 
if I can earlier. Okay. Each meeting, I'd look at the 29th of uh, June as a time frame to resolve police and fire deficiencies. Okay. So, <clears throat> so July 15th is the cutoff for any inter department transfers. That's the end, as the I would say, right? So you can't do any more willy right. nilly. So I want, that's why I want to do it on the 29th. Okay. So. We'll have to figure out what kind of a structural deficit we have from there remaining. Um, last year we had 80,000 from police to cover overtime and 40,000. So I think fire is pretty much on track, Chief. Fire looks like it's on track for the same amount as last year. Last year we did inter-department transfers yes. to cover 40, 41,000. Mm -hmm. I have my inter-department transfers here running about the same rate. So that's not too, too bad from, your, from the, that department's perspective. From the police department's perspective, it was eighty thousand dollars last year um, to one hundred and fifty-two. I mean, that's pretty significant. That's a seventy thousand dollar jump. Um, so there's some discussion that we're going to have to have overall moving forward. I just it always concerns me when if if we were, we can't cover our expenses and it really. It's unfortunate that I think, Mr. Kelly, you put a freeze on other departments' expenses right now, other than salaries. Correct. And you so it hinders not only is, is this problem hindering our other departments' ability to move forward and do what they need to do um, because of their allocated funds, we're actually taking from them now by freezing their expenses as well to cover this budget deficit. So I think there's a we definitely have a structural issue that we need to resolve. Um, I think it's it's. You know, I've been talking about this for quite some time, the structural deficits of municipalities where we only have so much money for budgetary reasons. So I think it's finally at the end game and it's gonna be a long, hard conversation that we're gonna have to have with residents and department heads and employees, but the time is here. It's it's not gonna be an easy conversation what we need to do. But I think we need, as you said, Mr. Chairman, we need to figure this out and get the money that's actually necessary to run these departments there. How do we do that with the limited funds that we bring in? We'll have to figure that out moving forward. It becomes an exercise in prioritization, right? What, what do we want our community to look like? What services do we want to provide for residents? Um, and that's why we ran for office, right? You've got a vision, you have a vision, I have a vision. Hopefully, collectively, we're able to put our, make it one vision, right? And so, I know uh, Mr. Gasper and you and I are kind of involved with the contractual negotiations for police and fire, um, but I do think, Mr. Hinckley, this is a good opportunity for you to, and if you have the time to do it, to work with Mr. Kelly, just to kind of wingman him sure. during this process up mm -hmm. until, you know, it's just a good immersion, yep. get a chance to learn. The more information yeah, I should absorb right yeah, now, the better. Be great. Try not to overburden myself and yeah, lose track of what I'm really paying attention to, but, you know, I'm good at taking notes and paying attention. Good. Mr. So, Kelly's a good teacher too. So. so Jamie, to be realistic, so you're looking at, you're targeting June 29th to provide us a, a recommendation on how to close the gap? I might come in on the 15th okay. with a, a partial one or dealing with one department and then okay. come in on the 29th with the second okay. or all of them. Good. So if I could have a motion to direct Mr. Kelly to work on a plan uh, and report back no later than June 29th with a plan to uh, uh, close the, uh, the deficit. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. He's, uh, he does have a little bit of wiggle room, as I said, to July 15th. Yep. The prime Understood. Year, so but it's you know, something again, that we've got to do, but I agree. A sense of urgency. The sooner the better. Create a sense of urgency. I got it. Gets things moving. You know, we just can't have things lingering. Um, thank you. All right, the next item on, uh, to the Chiefs, thank you very much. And I know this isn't a, a great conversation you like to have. Don't let this take away from the good work you do on a day-to-day. -day. You guys do outstanding work. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. Thanks. Thank All right, the next item um, on the agenda is Mr. Eric Arruda, who was asked to uh, come before the board. As you know, Mr. Arruda, Mr. Arruda will come to the podium. As you know, Mr. Arruda was a candidate for the fire chief's position. Um, and uh, the board uh, made, a, uh, made an appointment um, of Mr. Tom Farland. Uh, Mr. Arruda, in his, um, you know, his participation in that process, has some questions, questions of some things that he wanted to share with the board. 
and you know, just to you know, kind of clear the air, I guess, if you will, Mr. Ruder, this is your opportunity, right? This is your time um, to share with the board um, your view of the process, what you feel uh, you know um, took place or should have taken place. But I do want to just say this, and I'm not saying this to be um, uh, I'm not saying this to be uh, difficult, but legal counsel has said we do not have any obligation to do this. But we are doing it, right? And is that we felt like that it's the moral, it's the right <coughs> thing to do for a long-term employee. Um, and, and so the floor is yours. Um, I don't know that we'll take any action tonight. I think we'll take it under advisement. But this is your opportunity, and we wanted to give that to you. So uh, thank you, thank Mr. you, Chairman. Thank you for thank you for having the courage to, to come forward. Appreciate it. Uh, good evening, Board of Selectmen. Congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Hinckley. Uh, Mr. Kelly, Mr. Snyder. Good evening. Um, again, my name is Eric Abuda, one of the candidates, of, one of two candidates for the fire chief of the candidates uh, for the town of Akrishan. And the other candidate was that, like Mr. Warner, how the chairman said, uh, that was chosen by the board of selectmen was Thomas Farland. Uh, before I begin, uh, if I just may uh, ask, uh, Mr. Hinckley, were you, were you able to review uh, the uh, resumes? Uh, the, I was. Uh, all, you know, yeah. all the material, all the yeah. supporting Everything that material you that you had. Presented, I had it Excellent. here and I was able to review it. Very good, thank you. So gentlemen, on, on Thursday, May 5th, 2022, I submitted to the Board of Selectmen a formal appeal of the Fire Chief Candidate's appointment process that concluded with the appointment of Thomas Farland as the Town of Acushion's next Fire Chief. If you need a copy of that, I have it here. If you need it, if, you, if you've already seen it, that's that's fine. Um, the process for the appointment of the fire chief consisted of, of candidates being assigned an assessment center ranking weighted at 60% scenario based exercises, 40% written examination score, and then a final ranking weighted at 60% of the assessment center as a final score as a whole, added with a 20% education and 20% fire and EMS experience were to be developed by the town. The Board of Selectmen mentioned during the appointment process on April 12th of 2022 that having the assessment center conduct the, this process as well as having a fully transparent process was beneficial. Thomas Fallon and I agreed. In addition, the Board also mentioned that we should request and review the selection process results. Thomas and Fallon and I both requested the results and on April 22nd, 2022, 10 days later, the Acton Town Administrator, Mr. Kelly, thank you provided to uh, both of us the documentation, scores, and results used in the appointment process. Thomas Farland and I met, and a discussion was had over the results of the fire chief candidate appointment process, particularly the ranking basis sheet. And the ranking basis sheet was provided to the Board of Selectmen as the foundation for which they appointed the new fire chief. After a review, review, it became clear that the ranking basis sheet results proved to be inaccurate and included discrepancies, omissions, and incorrect facts. I told Tom that I would be submitting an appeal against the process and that the appeal was in no way against him. Tom mentioned to me that I should do what I feel I need to do what is right. Once the appeal was submitted, former chairman Mr. Droge directed me to supply the Board of Selectmen with a detailed list of what was omitted where inaccurate data was used and information that was incorrect. I've highlighted the areas on the ranking basis sheet of inaccurate results and areas where information was omitted. I have that here for you. Gentlemen, I also have a supporting doc document behind it, please. I'd like to we just uh, there was three really aspects to uh, the appointment process uh, to, uh, to the results uh, one was the 60% assessment center and then there was a 20% education component 
and then there's a 20% experience component. And I'd like to start with a uh, ranking basis. Uh, just a brief uh, information on the facts that, that were included and presented. Uh, so the town of Akushan had hired Badge Quest Incorporated for close to $9,000 to develop, construct, validate, administer, and score the Fire Chief Assessment Center. The assessment tested and evaluated our knowledge, our skills, abilities, and personal characteristics. Through a series of exercises, we were evaluated on our performance in each exercise using predetermined criteria. Badge Quest states that the process provided information about candidates that is unattainable from written tests, interviews, or other means. Through an orientation process, Tom and I were given uh, an overview of the assessment center, the exercise design or the rubric, protocols, the scope of the exercise, the parameters of role play, definitions, the scoring scale, and other information. Thomas Fowler and I both agreed that the exercises we performed and were evaluated on by Badge Quest Assessment Center was consistent with the challenges that were specific to the role of the Christian Fire Chief. Badge Quest Assessment Center process was a well-organized process that fairly measured the qualities needed for the chief of this department. During the appointment meeting, the Board of Sele uh, Selectmen stated that they were to choose, that they had to choose the fire chief candidate based on the assessment. The Board of Selectmen also stated that my leadership is key to the fire department. Once able to review the results of the process, my ability to lead was affirmed through the assessment center portion of the selection process. I discovered that the results of the assessment center validated myself as the most qualified candidate for chief of the Akrishnan Fire Department, with a considerable difference between the score of the other candidate, Thomas Farland, who was chosen by the next, uh, as the next fire chief of the Board of Selectmen. This discovery led me to review the entire fire chief candidate appointment process. The ranking basis for the 20% education evaluation developed by the town is inaccurate. And, put, and it's, this is important to note, please, there was no rubric supplied to the candidates explaining the criteria, the weight, the values, or what was going to be formulated for, into the results. The reference material, there was no reference material included to how the results values were figured. I'd like to start uh, in the result in the education where double credits were given for degrees. The education and value of a two-year degree is the first half of the total value of a four-year degree not an additional value. An associate degree transfers into a bachelor's degree program. And if I can use this as, as an example, candidate A uh, decides to go to Bridgewater State College to pursue a bachelor's in fire science administration. Candidate B goes to Bristol Community College for a two-year associates in fire science. After the two-year uh, stint in getting an associate's degree, candidates B then transfers to Bridgewater State College, where two years after that, both candidate A and candidate B walk across the stage and they get their bachelor's degree in fire science administration. And now candidate B gets more credit and gets credit for the, uh, for the, for the uh, associate's degree when it was part of the process. And so you can see that the created values on the educated score in the ranking basis sheet and on, on your sheets that you have in front of you, it was two points for an associate's degree, four points for a bachelor's degree, and then there was an additional four points for another bachelor's degree. But it's inconsistent with the values uh, written, and I have in that supporting documentation, uh, there was some values written on both candidates' resumes, where the resumes, uh, where on the resumes, the number of 2.5 uh, was written for each degree. Having double bachelor's degrees um, in a situation like that, and I, I, I can kind of reach back a little bit. <clears throat> in the age that we go to school in now, um, many of the courses are transferable. A lot of the core uh, courses are transferable. Uh, your basic science, uh, your math, your Englishes uh, are transferred. So having the same equal value to have the same, uh, to have a bachelor's degree and have those points doubled uh, was a question. One thing that I that I looked prior, we've we've this is the first process coming out of civil service uh, to be able to choose uh, a chief. Uh, the process before was always in civil service and the town and, and the fire department both agreed that we wanted to have a good look at the person and, and their abilities to be able to lead this department. 
as opposed to just having a good Saturday taking a test. So prior, prior to that, um, prior to the change, uh, one of the things that the civil service did do, and I know that we're not in there, uh, they had a, uh, a, a very strong list and ranking of how uh, degrees work and how it's, how, uh, how it's credited towards the individuals. And where, if you had a degree, whether it's associates or a bachelor's degree, uh, in the field uh, that you uh, were, were applying for the, for the job for, uh, that, was what, that was a certain value, it had a certain credit. And then any, any degree beyond that, it was a different value because it wasn't a direct involvement to, um, to that field. Now that, again, it's, we're not part of civil service, but it could have been used as a, as a, uh, as a point or a threshold or, or just a point of reference. Formal education acquired from the Massachusetts Fire Academy and other relevant, relevant education institutions necessary to perform at a technically advanced level was omitted. Education submitted through the application process, through the three answers to the questions requested by the Board of Selectmen, and through the inter interview process, they were also admitted. Additional education, education on the job, the education needed to maintain required certifications and licenses as both a firefighter and a paramedic can be found in the candidate's personnel files through the chief of the fire department's office. The fire chief was never consulted during the fire chief candidate appointment process, nor were the candidate's personnel files requested or reviewed. <coughs> In this day and age, an employee's personnel file is as important to an employer just as, as much as it is to the employee. Within it, you will find the history of the employee, education, all the training that they've uh, acquired throughout their career, and experience. For promotions, you may find accommodations and awards, but you also may find disciplinary issues and issues that could affect the overall department and the town. Again, the personnel file wasn't reviewed. My current, uh, my curricula vitae is located in my personal file and it includes over 1,400 hours of relevant education. 1,400 hours is the equivalent time it takes to gain a master's degree. That was also omitted. And gentlemen, I have the updated curriculum vitae here and again, if there was a look at the personal files, this is what Also within the education component, Thomas Farland did not receive credit for pro board certification. Uh, that was fo also found in his resume packet. Credit was, a, was awarded for an expired certification. Thomas Farland was given credit for an expired pediatric advanced life support certification that expired on October of 2021. And that was found in his resume packet. Now I talked to Tom, uh, it is valid. He has a valid, he's updated that. Um, but in the, the copy that you that was submitted to the board that got credit was was expired. The ranking basis for the 20% fire and EMS experience evaluation is inaccurate. Both candidates agree that the job of the fire chief requires years of experience. The job posting required a minimum seven years of full-time employment, service, serving as a full-time firefighter and EMT paramedic. There was no, again, just, just similar to the education, there was no rubric explaining the criteria, weight, or the val uh, value of the formulated for the results. There was no reference material uh, that was included uh, used in how the results were figured. But it was evident that the fire chief candidate's work experience was only given a value for years of service with the town of Akushnet. The years of service on the ranking basis sheet for myself are incorrect. I have 20 years of service. And with the town of Akushnet and on the ranking basis sheet, I was credited with 19. But I started to ask myself, how does years working for the town shed any light onto what kind of leader a person is or their ability to run the department? And I have another example for you. My wife gave this one to me. She, she helped me out with this one. So you're looking for a cardiologist to do your open heart surgery. Okay? No, I don't have that. This is just an example. Okay? Um, 
Are you looking at how long they've been a cardiologist? Or their proven performance? Years of experience tells us nothing about the level of experience. And I'd like to add this. The first three definitions from the Merriam-Webster's Dictionary of experience. It's the fact or state of having been affected by or gained knowledge through direct observation and participation. The second one is practical knowledge, skill, or practice derived from direct observation of or participation in events or in a particular activity, say firefighting or paramedicine. Now here's the third one where I can see where it can be a little confusing. The third definition says the length of such participation. And they gave an example. I just put the word, the, the, the name candidate in it. But the candidate has 10 years experience in the job. The years of service is not the experience. It's what, it's the length of such participation. What did they participate in? What did they gain for knowledge? What were their skills? What did they derive? And what, what did they take away from all those years? All relevant fire and EMS experience from within and outside the fire department was completely omitted for both candidates. The fire and EMS experience was submitted through the application process, the three answers to the questions requ uh, requested by the Board of Selectmen, and through the interview process. Again, all three of those things were omitted in formulating the education uh, experience score. My work experience as a highly skilled technical rescue technician under contract with the town of Akushnet, I have a memorandum of agreement, and I have for 12 years, for the town of Akushnet, for Bristol County, Massachusetts, and beyond, to work as a technical rescue technician. And four, we were, it was required that we carry four fields of technical rescue, and I've upped it to 10 for myself, and we have to maintain that, and we have to do a certain competency training every single year. The experience as a technical res rescue technician for 12 years was omitted. My work experience as the Accretion <laughs> Fire EMS training coordinator for the last nine years was omitted. My work experience as a state instructor, a trainer and a lecturer for the Department of Fire Services, the Massachusetts Fire Academy for the last three years, teaching firefighter recruits the education and the performance, the certifications that they have to have that, that we hire them to be able to have this job. Those three years were omitted. Additional experience, experience on the job, and experience training on, uh, needed to maintain required competency, certification, and licenses as a firefighter paramedic. That's right, you can be, it can be found in the candidate's personnel file through the chief of the fire department's office. The chief was never consulted in the fire chief candidate appointment process, nor were the candidate's personnel files requested or reviewed. My curriculum vitae, which you have in front of you now, gentlemen, that's in my personal file and includes additional work experience expected of the chief, such as introducing new policies, I've piloted new programs, a coordinated fire control and training, enforced codes, and all that was omitted. I just want to conclude here, as an educator at the state level for the Massachusetts Fire Academy Career Recruit Training Program, I have an influential connection to the minds of the next generation of firefighters. We strive to instill in them the importance and the value of continuing education throughout their careers in firefighting and emergency medicine and continuing to gain their va uh, valuable experiences through training and by returning to the fire academy and through other means. Tom and I both value education. We both have college degrees. But having a college degree was not a requirement to apply for the chief's position for the town of Akushnet. Obtaining a higher education proves that you can succeed in academia, but not necessarily in the real world job situation. Success in actual work proves more about what you have to offer. Seeking out relevant educational opportunities beyond degree programs exemplifies self-motivation, determination, and leadership qualities necessary for promotion and career advancement in the fire service. During the years as a full-time firefighter, EMT paramedic, I was it was and it is important to me to gain on-the-job leadership, management, and role experience above and beyond my current position. The Christian fire, uh, full -time staff, fire Department full-time staff has no promotional rank structure, but the organization of the Fire Department as a whole does, and it outlines the expectations of each rank. 
Looking at my expectations and my, uh, my experience and my accomplishments over the years, I have reached milestone goals that are consistent with the expectations of typical ranked firefighters, including the roles of lieutenant, captain, deputy chief, and chief. Gentlemen, the town was to develop the ranking of the 20% education and the 20% fire and EMS experience with the overall fire chief candidate process. All of my experience, formal education and, and the fire, uh, from the fire academy as well as other institutions were omitted in the fire chief selection process. I believe in the town of Acushnet, its people, its fire department, that they would want this process to be correctly and thoroughly conducted without error. The selection of the most qualified candidate is important to the future and the success of the Christian Fire Department. This fire, the, the fire chief appointment is, as I mentioned, is the first appointment selected from a process developed not under the laws of civil service. Hence the omissions, the inaccuracies, and discrepancies of the facts listed above is the reason why I am appealing the appointment and I am requesting that the Board of Selectmen reevaluate the full assessment process fairly and reconsider the decision for the next fire chief. The fire chief is the head of the department of the most critical safety infrastructure of the town of Akrishna and this community. It is crucial that the community and to the department that the most capable, knowledgeable, and experienced candidate be chosen to lead the Akrishna Fire and EMS department. Gentlemen, I greatly appreciate the, opp appreciate the opportunity to stand up here today and to be able to give you these facts and put myself out there. Thank you. Thank you. Don't have any comments. I mentioned, I think probably the best course of action would be to take this under advisement, um, digest it, go over it again, and report back, if at all. I think, Mr. Mr. Arruda, that's what we indicated would take place. This was your opportunity. Uh, I think you're, you made a, a, some, a compelling, some compelling arguments. Um, and uh, thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. I know Mr. Fallon is in the room. Mr. Fallon, thank you for being here as well. I know it's, uh, what, what really strikes me is on the surface, if you were watching from the outside, you'd say, wow, this is really uncomfortable, really awkward. But I think it's a testament to Chief Gallagher for the climate and the culture that you've created in your department. Mr. Fallon and you, Mr. Ruda that we were able to have this conversation tonight and it not be an awkward moment and not be an awkward conversation. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Next item on the new business. We have golf support staff. Yes. I hope. A process uh, which you're putting forward is uh, thought through. First, I want to say thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Welcome to Team Cushionet. What a great, great crew. Um, basically, the, uh, I'm here regarding the um, new hires for Bag Boy and, and grill, grill staff. Um, it, it's not an extension or expansion of, of staffing, it's basically replacement positions. Um, the golf committee has already uh, voted unanimously to uh, to submit them to you for your review for appointment. I think the key word, Dana, is we, we go through this exercise. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Um, I think we go through this exercise quite often, right? And mm -hmm. it's just because a certain young individuals are now found other things to pursue in life, right? And we give them an opportunity to start somewhere and work their way into and get a work ethic. Absolutely. To move Great. on into society, yep. into the corporate world, out of the high school figures in college and things of the like. So um, no additional cost to the budgets. Nope. Uh, we've done that already. It's just a replacement of individuals. As they go through their sequence of uh, development, they move on. Uh, I don't, I don't, personally I haven't experienced too many that have left the job for another job. Once they get the job, they kind of keep it through high school, college, and then until they get their careers. Um, but with COVID, there were some setbacks with staffing, uh, but now coming out of COVID, everybody wants to get out and hustle again. So that's, that's a good thing. And we are busier than ever. Uh, we just finished the month of May. We actually beat last month's, uh, last year's month of May. 
which uh, was a great month, it was a great year, and uh, so far it is the only month of the fiscal year where we um, surpassed the previous year's month's uh, sales revenues. So, <clears throat> um, real brief executive summary, staying with the tone, uh, we are plus 434K on, on the forecasted budget um, for this fiscal year. We are, compared to last year's um, high water mark, uh, we're down 135 to last year, but that was the perfect storm of the season. Um, sunshine, no rain, everybody was home, kids, families, nobody was working, everybody was playing golf. So coming out of that, we're now we're seeing people going back to work, kids are back at school, activities have kicked up again. We're seeing an 8% reduction in participation. Um, looking at the numbers more in depth, we've seen an increase 2% on weekends with the product mix, minus 8% on the weekday play, uh, which is typically where you're finding your, you know, your guys that are, have gone to work. They're going back to work, so they're not sure. playing golf. <clears throat> So with that being said, I'm putting it out there that we're probably gonna fall in the realm of 1.8 and a half million for the fiscal closing of the season, but depending on weather and participation from here on out, um, that'll, you know, that'll play itself out. When, so people at home don't get all crazy. Mm -hmm. 1.8 is the final number, but this, the budget is 1.5 or so, right? Correct. So it's well, the well, subtraction of the two numbers. I don't want people at home to think that we're making a profit of $1.8 million. No. Okay. Not, no. Just to be clear. That <laughs> yes, thank you. That's in a couple of years. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully so. But so good job. Great. I mean, it's, uh, it's good stuff. Hopefully that uh, participation rate will stay up there. I know mm -hmm. I've just read some reviews from Mr. Isaac. Um, course is in great yes. shape, play is good. Um, staff is very helpful and friendly, so kudos to you and your Appreciate staff that. out there keeping everybody going. Um, we got ranges now like, to keep in play going, Correct. so that's a good thing, and that helps drive more people in and see we're not held It up. also helps them behave a little so, bit better out there, less repairs, less problems. Um, we, we invested a little bit more in salaries, but it's did. paying off on the back end, right? right. That's what we're all about is, you know, what's the return on investment, right? And yes. we're going to look at that as an ROI and say, is it paying off or is it not? If it's not, we'll go revert back to the old, but I'm glad to see that the ROI is really paying off. So that's, that's awesome. To speak to that too, with COVID actually served a great advantage to us because in the market of golf, we're the low, play, low price leader with the best conditions, municipal golf course in the area. When golfers go play golf and they go play somewhere else, they talk about where they played last or what their best experiences are. So with everybody playing golf through COVID, we kept coming up in the conversation. So now as this weans and everybody goes back to work, we're still seeing a strong support of revenue from those people. Sure. So, and word of mouth goes a long way, right? A Especially long in business. Way. So they go back to work, they tell their coworkers. You know, Correct. I just played here, but it cost me X amount of dollars, and you get equal play or better play and a cushion it for a lot less, mm -hmm. and then people start trying that out, and it's, it's working. And if we support that with training the staff appropriately and having some additional staffing for rangering and bag boy duties, that all comes together with a better product. So, right. Mr. Hanley, anything? Well, golf's not really my forte, so <laughs> I'll just take your word for it. Yeah, come, um, well, please come on, visit. come by and visit and check, check it out. Definitely come through. I'd love to give you a tour, open. show you the, uh, the lay of the land, and uh, get you up to date on some of our situations. Yeah, and, uh, so we'll so here's the deal. We, I think we did this years ago, mm -hmm. and I, I think we'd have to post it as a selectman's meeting. But didn't we, go, we went out we did. and we did a round of golf. Yes. Even if it's nine holes, mm -hmm. I think we should... Oh, I don't know if I did a round of golf. Part. <laughs> you know, no, you, you, you know, did the I'm tour. You did the tour. <laughs> bought the beer. Yeah, so I bring the beer. Should, uh, let's, let's make a point to do that for Mr. Hinckley's benefit at some point over the yes. summer. We'll grab lunch I mean, there and then do a tour. That way you know what we're talking yeah, about. We're speaking yeah. the golf course. I think we're going to go see Dana first and get sure. some tips, you know. Sure. Right. Yeah. Definitely should limit it to maybe like three holes. <laughs> well, we have a good layout Hopefully for that. Hopefully there's not a lot of windows around. <laughs> No uh, windows. Oh, certain areas. Yeah. yeah. So, so Dana, first, first of all, um, we need a motion to uh, appoint Moreo Almeida and Matos uh, yes. to the golf course. So, in seconds. 
That's all of them. He oh, just yeah, used last name. Okay. So uh, there's a motion. There's a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. This made me feel like it was the 1980s and I was picking teams on the playground with the names of Moreo and Almeida, <laughs> right? How things come full circle. Um, and then, uh, Dan, just a testament to you. We talked about it earlier, the culture of the fire department. You've mm -hmm. had, it's an, un, it's an untold story, but the impact you've had on kids who've walked through that door who've worked for you. It's been awesome. Uh, it's something that it's one of my probably, favorite things at the job. You never thought was part of the job <coughs> description, but mm -hmm. it's a, a, a give back to you. I know one, one man now, Eric Kudo, who always talks about it's mm -hmm. the greatest thing that's ever happened to him. And I still a, hear from Peter Clerk, Mark Sweet, the first guys that I came kids, in touch with, they right, all come back. All over the years, and now they're men, they have families, yep. and a lot of it has to do with, with your influence that you uh, have had over there and given them an opportunity to make mistakes, mm -hmm. build on it, and then you know you, you treat them like they're CEOs. Yep. You know, and they're, they're, that's what people, I, kids need to as understand. As much as responsibilities they're willing to take on, we, we put them yeah. in those positions so they feel confident. It, it's a, it's a, it's, working for Dana over there, you get an MBA as a 14, 15, 16, 17 year old. You know, the best education you can get, so thank I you. I push that. all of our kids to, when they hit 18, to have a brokerage account. Up and running. Yeah. Get them started. I'm not, no, not that's joking. awesome. Push them. Yeah. Get their minds going. Get ahead of the game. Yeah, that's it. Good for you. All right. Well, thank you. Anything else we need to do? Uh, I guess we. The only thing that's here is a lot more. Yes, all I have no idea what this all about. incumbent short funds. Yeah, we're going to bring that up in the next meeting. Okay. Is there a motion to uh, take? Yeah, reviewing our expenses and line items at this time of the year. As we know, we come to June, so it's crunch time, and we're going through that process currently. I just found the money that we can use to close our deficits. <laughs> <laughs> How did I know that was coming? Once and I was like, do off, I right? want to say this today? Today? Yeah. Uh, how much? So Thank you. I encourage a lot of kids to get brokerage accounts too. <laughs> yeah. I actually, I tell them investment accounts because you, you know why they call them brokers, right? Because they'll make you broker. <laughs> True. So, you know, educate yourself in finance. Yeah. Um, no, junior do some, do some reading and dabble <laughs> around with a thousand bucks, a few hundred bucks, and absolutely learn learn the game. But you know, a lot of people get hurt in that game. Oh yeah, I've been in. Yeah, no dive in. All right, but it's good stuff. Right, Thanks, thank Dana. you, Dana. Good seeing you. Appreciate it, guys. Thank All you. Right. See, you, see you soon. Next item on the agenda is a designee for CERTA. Uh, Mr. DeRoche had taken that uh, position and did a really good job with it. Mr. Hinkley has expressed an interest in his motion to appoint. Second. All those, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Great, thank you. All right, next item, discussion for first reading. As you may recall, gentlemen, uh, I sent an email out to town administrator um, and on the board. I think it reflects the sentiment of the board, so I, I acted on that. Um, escalating town council costs. And you know, this is something that I've experienced and seen over the years, and we had a policy in place. Um, well, I'm all for giving staff and key staff and elected boards the resources they need to do the job. Um, we got to be able to, you know, control the amount of, uh, you know, how often we're uh, getting a hold of town council. We have a, a lawyer on board now uh, who can help with that. And so, um, with that said, Mr. Po uh, Mr. Kelly has developed a policy. Uh, this is first reading. Ask that the board take a look at it. Uh, but essentially, it's just to put some structure around town council, uh, asking those who want it to, you know, the who, what, where, when, and why. It's got to go through the town administrator and the board, and then you know it's a requisition form. I think it's pretty, pretty basic stuff. Shouldn't keep people from doing what they need to do, uh, but at least just gives us some idea and control of the uh, information flow. I, I, I'd be ready to act on it right now. I've already discussed this, read this, better that it is something that we've, a past practice that we've always had in place and we kind of lost track of that practice through different town administrators, but um, and obviously we're at the structural deficits, especially in town council the past two years. Um, I think it's cumulative, it's $180,000. That's the number, two years. Yep. And so um, that's, that's just, um, we can't continue to go down this road of, of those kind of deficits and you know we get to look at the bills and see where it's being rung up and you know I think there's a time and place where you need to call town council and I think there's other times where it's just nice to be able to do it and that's what's been occurring so I would be ready to okay. vote well, this policy okay. in today. Right. Gentlemen is there a motion to approve uh, the access to town council policy? So moved. Second. 
There's a motion on the floor. There's a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Warren, for bringing that. My back. pleasure. Um, Jamie, maybe you can post this on our web page. Um, or, or I think it's important for the general public to know that we're doing this. Um, and we'll also make sure that all department has the board. Yes. Uh, just a quick note. Uh, also in your packet is a letter from KP. Uh, they're going up on basic services from 48000 to 54000 next year. And so is that a reminder to go out to bid for our new uh, Well, if, uh, when you uh, we'll be discussing that shortly. Great. Thank you. All right. Uh, I think it's a good reminder, Mr. Chairman. Yes. All right. I guess the next item is under um, information only. That's just for all. You don't have to go through that. Uh, town administrator report. All right. Town administrator report. Good segue. Uh, first item. Uh, I'm working with the town accountant to issue an RFP for the audit. The audit went up ten thousand dollars from last year to this year. Um, I've got an RFP for legal counsel we'll be putting out. Uh, I've notified NFP, the health insurance consultant for the town, to compile the necessary data, and we will be issuing an RFP for health insurance after the 14% increase that we got hit with this year. For IOD and PNC insurance, I've met with the district manager of Maya as well as a representative from Braley and Wellington, which there are about half a dozen entities that represent these group purchasing uh, entities for insurance. I've met with two of them. We're going to go over the uh, uh, loss ratio sheets for the last five years. I'm going to meet with the others that would be interested, and then we'll put out an RFQ. That way we can at least stay ahead of the curve, test the marketplace, because if the auditor and legal counsel have increased their rates and health insurance increased the rate, even though Maya kept us flat this year, I imagine it's right around the corner. So we might as well get the best deal possible. Uh, there's a list of potential warrant articles for the fall town meeting besides the financial issues that we're going to have to deal with with a couple of the deficits and uh, any of the issues that are coming down the pike as far as going forward with going from bonds to bonds on the buildings. Also the uh, FEMA fund approval for COVID testing is <coughs> in and uh, the ARPA projects we're going to have to address in the next two to three months. That would be nice. We have, uh, we've only gotten uh, $556,000 of our <coughs> so far. The county hasn't opened their portal yet. The second tranche, which I didn't know that term until two days ago, which yeah. means portion. Yeah, sure. Uh, What's up with that? Uh, it's, uh, from the uh, federal government, it's going to be released <coughs> shortly to the state and then the, through the state to us. What's the time frame on it, do you know? Uh, they're talking about 60 days. From now? To get to the state. What's the anticipated wait once it gets to the state? We don't know. But the state, the last time, moved it fairly quickly through the state to the towns. Well, that compared should, to should how into the board's conversation of what we're going to do with that opera money we talked about, slowly <coughs> sidewalks and things of the like. 
Um, I'm still stuck on that. It's infrastructure. That's what the money was there for and allocated from the federal government to do. So I'd like to have that conversation because if we're going to have to do engineering and things of the like, that's going to take a little bit of time, and then we have to spend it by a certain date. Is is true, right? The you would have to have it the plans in and the shovels beginning by 24, and you would have to have it completed by 26. So it's happening fast. <coughs> it so it's time to move. Uh, furniture has arrived. Uh, senior work on program. Uh, Heather has asked the department heads for potential projects for these folks. Then we, uh, once we review the projects, then we'll be coming to you, the board for a final approval uh, for the program, the forms, and we'll go forward. We're looking at that sometime in June. Infrastructure projects you've seen. Uh, we're waiting on the earmarks. Uh, I've done some work in Lake Street. We've met with the mayor of New Bedford. And uh, that's as far as we're going. TIP project is going through that process. And as you know, the bridge is going out to bid. In addition, uh, the next item, Mr. Chairman, on the agenda is I put an unemployment compensation service agreement. It's from a company known as Unemployment Taxation Management. And it's uh, a company I've used in numerous municipalities for very short money. They represent the towns and all unemployment hearings. They do all the filings with the state and they take care of uh, all of the issues as far as uh, the uh, issues in-house here, they would be able to assist Jasmine. Uh, it's a great service and it's uh, $585 a quarter. And we've got a budget of $50,000 that we budget for unemployment. This would free up our uh, staff so our staff doesn't have to respond every time an unemployment claim comes in. Most of them we disavow because someone is working for someone else and might be a call firefighter, let's say. Well, they are not eligible under us, but we still have to file all the paperwork. For this amount of money, it's uh, a great deal. and. One of the reasons I brought it before the board is, as you know, I'm the new guy in town. And uh, in other communities, this did not hit the threshold that I would need a board approval. It would just be a signature of the town administrator. But I wanted to tell the board about it and see what uh, the board uh, wants on this. If you want to authorize me to sign this agreement, then uh, a vote of the board. And I would ask that the board consider these type of agreements. Is there a threshold they would want me to sign and then report to the board? Or do you want me to bring each one forward to the board? Uh, you vote on it, and then I sign it. I think it's, you bring it to the board, and then then we authorize a signature. But I think for 2340 bucks, and you said to me, I believe, and just for everybody watching in the boards, you said to me that they actually, if there's a claim, a workman's comp claim, they actually have attorneys that go. So yes. that kind of, you talked about the 50 grand, but it kind of frees that up. So for 2340 bucks, if we have a claim, they send their personnel in, and we're free and clear of any and all and other we expenses. And we don't have to ask KP to represent us. Well, I think it's a no-brainer. 
Yep. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Second. Uh, Thank you. Aye. Good job. Thank you, Mr. Thank Kelly. You. All right, we did the uh, item of meeting mail. Uh, future meetings, selectmen's meetings, June 15th, 2022, 4 p.m. You usually do like announcements. Mr. Hinckley, do you have anything that you want to offer? Uh, right now, I'm just still absorbing, uh, taking a lot of it in, listening to a lot of people, and uh, meeting a lot of people in town, uh, sure. which is nice, trying to get around meeting department heads uh, on my day off during the week, and so far, so good. good. Uh, been getting a pretty good reception, and uh, seems to be you know, easy to navigate. Uh, Lisa's been quite the help, <laughs> so I appreciate you. Um, other than that, uh, still ready to work. Sounds Looking good. Looking forward to it. Great. Gasper. I have nothing. Memorial Day's over. Can't right. wish everybody a happy, safe Memorial Day weekend. All right. It's all it be gone. And it's official uh, kickoff of summer, right? So, uh, okay. So the next time we've got two executive sessions we have to go in. We will not reconvene. So first is... Excuse uh, me. Can yes. I say something? Because I'm going to... I have to say something, Cheryl Bryan. Um, I'm trying to understand why some of this stuff has to be done without the public's knowledge, without us residents having to know what's going on, because you're going to be talking quietly about the soil thing, and that in, that includes PJ Heating. What are you talking about? Because we don't have that on our agenda. In the beginning of the meeting, when you did the, when you did the soil meeting, yeah. the, right? You guys were talking about PJ Heating, that you had to talk amongst yourselves and da-da-da-da. Did they not? No, Mr. Gasper, okay. is, is Mr. Gasper said that you, the board would like to go into executive session Correct. to discuss the lawsuit which the town was up against the town. So there are certain things that we can and cannot do, right? So right. In order to, if you have a legal strategy, as you'll see tonight, we're going to go into contractual negotiations. If you listen to the motion, there are certain things we can discuss, and there's also things that we cannot discuss in public because it's detrimental. So that's Excuse me if I'm wrong, but we're not even getting the information that we can have. I don't, I don't understand. Am I wrong with that? I don't think that I am. Because, well, I, I'd like to know what happened to them having the cease and desist, and they haven't had an injunction. What's going on? Like, and then all they get charged is a lousy $300 a day. That's like charging me 25 cents if I'm doing something wrong in town. Yeah. Really? I think the Board of Health, that's from the Board of Health. See? And they're doing a public. Uh, it's a public uh, session. It's an appeal. It's not a public eighth. hearing. It's an appeal. On the eighth, it's an appeal from of uh, of their order. Of June eighth. We, I believe, it's a board of health meeting. June so 8th? June eighth. Now, will this be will this be advertised? I think it's going it's on. Through uh, I wrote board. something yeah. for the June first. It was at Council on Aging because originally they did something May twenty fourth or twenty sixth. Part of me, if I'm wrong in the dates, I don't. Um, um, they both at Council no, on Aging. Twice. Twice. Yeah, yeah it's been and twice. it just came. It just came in that uh, it's going to be in the cafetorium, and I think oh, so it's on the seventh. And it's either the eighth or the ninth. I'm sorry, yes. but it just came in to us. So it's, it's a board not of health. our uh, here. That's a board of health um, appeal. Um, PJ Keating's appealing the cease and desist from the board of health. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's a board of health meeting. Right. So you just watch for the board of health's agendas, and it should obviously it's got to be posted within 48 hours hours prior to whatever right. date though seventh or eighth or whatever but right but i'm trying to understand the fact that they've had a cease and desist order since when eighth. and they're That's still is the eighth they're still in functioning health understood because you know what three hundred dollars to them is nothing I understood nothing. the board of health is the one who has jurisdiction over that over that particular issue and so well why is that because you, you do the fight you have the finance committee as well aren't they supposed to put Submit fines to the finance committee. No, no. we're not the finance no, committee. The There's finance a nine-member finance yeah, committee right. um, that that does that. So the fines don't. That's usually with revenues in, uh, for being expended from taxation. So fines aren't gone. They don't go through the finance committee. So that's something that the board of health will issue a so fine. The board of health. What regulates issue? the fines. The fines. And then as we already had this discussion, it was an open session and we've talked about it numerous times. Matter of fact, I think Selectman Wonat talked about can we up that amount, but right. by statutory um, law, 
you can only find up to the $300 that threshold. That's state's maximum. Yeah, yeah. So you can't do no more. I know that. Um, and, and, you know, obviously everybody gets it, right? I hear from people all the time, right? right. I, was just, I was just, as I said, I went to Anthony Street today. Um, and usually when I drive down Main Street, I got my nose out the window like a dog sniffing because, and the one thing that I had noticed was the asphalt coming out onto Main Street, ripping around the corner. Um, so there's, there's issues there, right? But again, um, we're, we're in litigation, and I mentioned going into um, having a, a, an executive session with the board as the soil board with all due respect to mr hinckley i know he's been trying to follow things but he hasn't been privy to the no, information we that, that, that we have then. so that. it's an update for mr hinckley it's it's an opportunity for the board to strategize when it comes to some of the issues before we go into okay. open session and have that dialogue with the public okay may i make a suggestion that mr hinckley take a tour of PJ Keating before he even considers talking about it because he has no idea. He should I be think allowed. He's, he's, he's got I an idea. I don't think he knows what the internals look like. Yeah. Cool. Right. Got a well, I think, I think that's important, you. Kevin, that he, he takes a physical look with his well, eyes. I, I, I agree. I'm loaded with pictures. So, yeah. so here's the No, deal. I think oh. seeing it and looking at no, pictures are two totally different things. Two totally different the things. The gravity of the situation. Ma look, I'm all for discussion, but as you can see tonight, Right, it's just my, I, I like to run a tight ship, but I'm all for having a public discussion. And if you want to be placed on the agenda, or if you want to talk to Mr. Hinckley about what he should and shouldn't do, I'm all for that. But we've got other business to do, and if you want to come speak to us, put right. you on the agenda. I agree with that. I wasn't telling him what to, to okay, do yeah. or not to do, but as a collective, you are a selectman. Mm -hmm. And that's who I feel I should ask if he's going to be making any comments or any decisions about this, he needs to know everything. I think BJ Keating's management team would be more than willing to have a new selectman go in and take a tour of it. I don't think he needs think to be guided by anybody there. I think, um, I think Mr. Hinkley could speak for himself. I, have, that, right? I think a big part of it. Uh, well, what are you getting, getting to? Poor, to a violation of the open meeting. Because we're not on the agenda to discuss. I know. But. Just trying to give the president the yeah. It's okay. Thank you, and don't hit that spider when you're walking by. Kevin. Some answers. <laughs> it's gonna go right in my mouth. All right. So we are gonna go into executive session. Two exec, two separate executive sessions. Um, one executive session under General Law 30A, subsection 21A2, to conduct strategy and preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel, or to conduct contract contract negotiations with non-union personnel. Fire chief. If an open meeting will be will have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the public body as the chair so declares and the board will not return to public session. Second executive session under general law 30A subsection 21A3 to conduct strategy and preparation for negotiations with union personnel or to conduct contract negotiations with union personnel. Police fire asked me DPW if an open meeting will have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the public body as the chair so declares and the board will not return to public session. We will not reconvene. Is there uh, two separate two votes. separate votes on the first one? Uh, roll call vote, Mr. Hinckley? Aye. Mr. Gasper? Yes. And I'm a yes. On the second one, Mr. Hinckley? Yes. Mr. Gasper? Yes. And I'm a yes. We are now going into executive session. We will not reconvene.